So, uh, so uh, welcome, welcome back from tea break, everybody. I think, I think we'll get going again. I'm really crowd. Too much, too much excitement in the room. I know you've all been concentrating very hard already today, but luckily we have a fantastic final panel. But haven't they all been fantastic today? Um, So the, the theme of this session is productivity. My name is Diane Coyle from the Bennett Institute, and it's one of my core research areas and one of our core research themes. Distinct from progress, you'll notice, but it's something um, that we might touch on in the discussion here, how those two relate to each other, what the overlaps or, or conflicts are there. And I'm not going to read out the biographies in the program, um, just, but just to say this is a wonderful panel. I'm really delighted they're here. And indeed, they're all sitting in the right place, so you can tell, tell who's who. Um, <laughs> no, they're not, sitting, they're not sitting in the right place. <laughs> but we'll, we'll live with it. So uh, Professor Bart Van Ark, Professor Meredith Crowley, and uh, Julia King, Baroness Brown of Cambridge. So a really distinguished panel. And we'll do the same thing. We will um, ask them each to uh, say a few words initially, give us their perspective on this, on this broad theme. I might do some follow-ups. They might talk to each other a bit. And then we will come to the audience for, um, for questions and comments as well. And I want to start with Bart. Bart, you are the Managing Director of the Productivity Institute based in Manchester. And it's, one, it's the ESRC's biggest ever research investment. So you're an economist like me. Could you start by sketching out what is this beast productivity? What does it mean? And, and why does it matter? Thanks, Diane. Well, you're already putting me in a difficult spot because as an economist and you, know, you talk about productivity, you have to begin with the concept that's not very popular in this room today so far. Because economists, most of the time, fairly enough, will talk about productivity at some measure of GDP per hour worked or GDP per person employed. And we've had really good discussions around this today. Uh, that, that perhaps is not the ideal concept if you want to talk, talk about progress. But we also have to admit, and I think we all agree, that unfortunately or not, still 99 to 95% of people out there still talk about GDP. That's how business people, how the city, how lots of people still measuring this. So we have still a lot of good work to do in this space. And Diane, you actually should get a lot of credit as one of the people in the Productivity Institute to help us really think more creatively about you know, that output is perhaps not quite the right concept to look at and that we need to think much more broadly around this. But you know, to start with that economist concept, output per hour, that is what you read in the media. Uh, that's where a lot of the popular discussion is around. And, and, and when you look at that concept, we of course see this sort of slow down in productivity growth. We have this perception that this is worse in the UK than it is in other advanced economies, which is true to some extent, although the latest revisions by the Office of National Statistics actually shows that that gap with the other countries is perhaps not that big as we thought before. Uh, we also now begin to figure out that maybe it's not so much in the fact that we in, don't, don't invest as much in our regular capital things, uh, but that a lot of this is something in what economists call a much more difficult concept called total factor productivity, which is that after you take account of investments in capital and so on, there's something left, which is the way you put all your resources together and the output you get out of that you call total factor productivity. That seems to have slowed a little bit more in, uh, in the UK than it has elsewhere. And that probably has to do with some things that we'll talk about, well, that we a lot talked about also early today, but talk a little bit more about, uh, which is lack of diffusion of technology, uh, which has to do with you know, weakness in the skill base that we have in the UK, particularly in the intermediate skills end of our skill base. And of course, has a lot to do with issues around place uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you can, however, and now I'm going a little bit out of my comfort zone as economist, you can stretch that concept. You can basically, begin, first of all, begin to say, well, maybe GDP is not quite the right concept. We have to think about other things that have something to do with progress. But if you talk about productivity, you then also have to think about the input side and think about what, what are then the type of inputs we need to create that output or outcome concepts that we have. So the way that I like to talk about productivity is not necessarily about output or GDP per hour, but more like what are actually the outcomes that we're interested in and what are the resources that we need in order to get there. So you can already see we're stretching that concept. We can now begin to include a lot of things that we talked about, for example, in the previous panel about environmental resources and at the input side, you talk about natural capital. 
Many of you will have heard this concept of intangible capital, which is not just about human capital, but also technology inputs and organizational competition and so on. So if you begin to think about these kind of concepts, you're stretching your concepts uh, uh, quite significantly and productivity becomes something that's beginning to look a little bit more like progress. I want to make, if you allow me, one very quick comment on, uh, on uh, some of our early discussions, because there's always this sort of you know, debate that we're having about it shouldn't be growth. You know, we shouldn't be talking about growth. We need to talk about progress. Well, when I think about productivity, it's always about something, about an outcome over the resources you need. And you either do more with the same, or you do the same with less, or you do less with even less, right? But it's always, you have to look at both sides of the equation, and it's always growth, or it is degrowth. It's one thing, or it is the other. So I think we, we have to sort of be a little bit careful how we think about this term growth. If it is about progress, it's fine. You know, we, we love to talk about letting our kids grow up. We like to talk about leveling up. So why wouldn't we want to talk about growth of the economy if we think, as uh, Matthew said earlier quite correctly, it's about what kind of growth are we, are we talking about? So business people, because that's the other part of this, they don't really talk much about productivity. We did some research into this and other have done this as well. Productivity is not really a big part of the narrative in the business community. Sometimes when they sit on panels that will mention the word, there are very few businesses that measure productivity as a key performance indicator. And this is a bit of an issue because if you go to businesses and you say, well, what are you actually thinking around productivity? That will come up with all sorts of KPIs, efficiency measures, um, cost efficiency measures, cost savings, uh, technical efficiency measures that I want to talk about, but quite often it's not productivity. We think this is actually an issue because we, have, we, we think we're missing a bit of an opportunity here. If you talk to a CHRO in a company, you talk about productivity, he or she will probably talk about, well, it's probably some measure of worker engagement and, and health and well-being in the company because that's what makes my workers productive. If you talk about a CFO, it's probably around cost efficiency. And if you talk about a COO or a digital uh, manager, it may be about the sort of the technical efficiency part of it. So we think it's really important also in the, in, the, in the business community to think about what are these different ways that in functions in companies should talk about productivity. And bringing that together in the boardroom really would then enrich the discussion on how business can contribute to this productivity story. You know, so you now you talk about, okay, um, 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 how are you doing it? How are you turning your inputs into your outputs where I started? But you're still talking about for how much are you doing it? So how are you using your budget in order to, to buy yourself the right inputs and the right resources? But you very much also talk about why are you doing it, which is about how do you turn your outputs into outcomes? In other words, you're not only talking I mean, you're about in, in productivity, you're not only talking about whether you do whether you do things right, but also whether you do the right thing. You know? And sometimes you can do productivity, which sounds like doing it right, but uh, but you're not doing the right thing. So I think. You know, there, there's a lot in this concept of productivity if you stretch it away from this economist term, which is my comfort zone, to uh, concepts that are wider, that take into account well-being, that take into account environment, and that we can also begin to use in the business community to have a much more productive, productive conversation. Can I ask you to say a word as well, Bart, about um, public sector productivity, because I know that's mm. one of your areas of particular interest. Yeah, um, well, we've got a lot of people from the public sector here yeah, who will yeah. be taking notes furiously. Yeah, actually, I have to confess something. I did an, an interview uh, a while ago for the, uh, for the Financial Times, and the headline, unfortunately, was a remark that I did make, which was that productivity was done by the private sector, which I simply made, just from a mathematical point of view, it's the largest part of the economy, so most of the productivity comes from there. That didn't give me a good day on Twitter, um, <laughs> because people said, oh, how can you ever say that? So I, I had to sort of deliver something there and make up for my guilt, I guess. Uh, so got into, uh, you know, what are the issues around public sector productivity? Public sector productivity is important for two reasons. One, of course, the public sector itself is a significant part of the economy. It's, you know, during COVID, it was 50% of our spending was actually uh, done by government and by the public sector. But there's also 20% of the economy in terms of uh, output and, and also in terms of employment. So that's important. But then, of course, the public sector, as we discussed all day today, and that's all you do all your work around in the Bennett Institute, is all about what does the public sector do to the rest of the of society and the economy. So, so I went into this um, and again thought about these the, the same discussion I talked about before: resources, you know, what's your budget, inputs, what do you spend your money on? How do you create these inputs to outputs, which is the boring part, but it's quite important. How do you use your inputs in order to technically get those outputs? 
but also how do you get to outcomes? And a lot of the confusion in the public sector is quite often in mixing up outputs and outcomes, right? Of course, you want to do, if you're a hospital, you want to make sure that you know, the, the people actually are not coming to you, that are healthy, and that if they come to you, that they can go home as quickly as possible and can lead a healthy life. That's outcome. But the output is that obviously you have you know, good surgery and that you have good ther therapies and everything else. These things quite often get confused in public sector organization. And I think it's critical in public sector organization to really understand what I call this delivery chain from resources to inputs to output to outcomes and begin to see where are the bottlenecks? Where are we, first of all, are we doing the right thing and are we doing things right? And, and if that's the case, you know, where are the bottlenecks in our process? And let's try to organize ourselves around it because there's so much going on in the public sector and there's so many things that public sector managers have to deal with every day that sometimes it just looks yeah, too complicated. And that's what I hear quite often. You know, I did, I, I did a dozen interviews uh, with public sector manager and quite often what I've heard is say, it's just too complex, there's just too much going on. So organizing your thinking around this and developing that productivity narrative in the same way as I argue to do that for private sector companies I think it's going to be really helpful, I hope. Thank you, Bart. I'm going to turn next to Julia. I mean, Bart's talked about stretching the concept, but it's, a, it's about the way you link resources and outputs. You're sort of coming from the other end of the telescope and, and thinking about the resource use aspect of it. Yes, thanks, Diane. I must admit, I had, I had what I shall now refer to as my Sarah Dillon moment when you, uh, when you asked me to come, <laughs> to come and join this panel, which is, uh, for those who missed Sarah this morning, um, is that, what am I doing on this panel? Because <laughs> <laughs> my background in the last 15 years or so has, has really been in, in climate change and climate change policy, in particular with, with the Committee on Climate Change. Um, but I'm very glad you did ask me because it, it made me think about what is the relevance um, of, of productivity to our work on, on climate change. Um, and and it, I, I think it probably really does help us to start looking at, at climate change through, through a productivity lens, um, both in terms of, of adaptation to climate change. Um, we know that the, climate, the changing climate is already causing us increasing disruption um, in the UK and, of course, globally. Uh, but we still find it very hard to get investment in, in adaptation and resilience measures. We find it really hard to make the case. We find it really hard to grab people's attention um, to do something about these things. And yet, you know, we see the disruptions to transport, the disruptions to supply chains, um, failures of the electricity system, um, overheating in people's homes with everybody working from home, a significant reduction in our productivity in hot summer weather in houses unsuitable um, for the, the weather conditions we're now experiencing even in, in this country and productivity of agricultural workers picking coffee in, in really um, uncivilized conditions. Yet actually an area where there is very little research and numerical data, so please let me encourage, but you know, reduced food production, forest fires causing reduced wood production, um, all of these things that are what I would call kind of product, really important productivity issues and yet we never phrase them, apart from the, the, the heat in people's homes, to be honest, we never really phrase them as, as productivity measures. And it, and it made me think, uh, would that be a better way of sometimes of communicating to policymakers, particularly in the UK, because as Bart has reminded us, UK productivity is such a sensitive issue because we've got this feeling that we're so much worse than everybody else. So whether that's a kind of emotional hook for some of our politicians as a way of kind of talking about impacts of climate change. Um, but also we're always looking, and again, this is something Bart was talking about when he was talking about the public sector and productivity. We're always looking in adaptation for ways of identifying the right metrics that will tell us that the adaptation investments we're making are making a difference. Are they making us more resilient? And that in many areas is quite a hard thing for us to tell. We know these sound like sensible things to do, but how do we show that we have done the right thing? Uh, and actually, I think a productivity lens on that. So again, an encouragement to colleagues from the Bennett Institute and elsewhere to think about that as, as an area they could help us with as to can we use a kind of productivity impact measure there uh, as a way of measuring impact of, of adaptation and resilience investment. So I think that was, that was kind of on the, on the negative side, climate change is impacting productivity. 
Um, on the mitigation side, um, I think we should see the, the transition to net zero as one that actually is all about um, increasing resource productivity. Uh, we tend to call it resource efficiency, actually, as Bart was saying, that business tends to call it um, efficiency. But it's about doing more with less, doing more with less energy, doing more with less material input, um, doing more with less travel. And we've seen the benefits. We saw initially, at least, the benefits of that um, at the start of, uh, of lockdown. But um, we, we tend to, and I think if you look through Committee on Climate Change reports, um, I almost doubt whether you will see productivity mentioned at all. We tend to look very traditionally at what are the impacts going to be on GDP. Um, uh, and I think actually productivity could be a very helpful way of phrasing that because um, improving resource productivity has the benefit of minimizing inputs, but improving GDP can drive you to maximize inputs sometimes, which is exactly what we don't want to do. And that, of course, helps us make the link to, um, to the circular economy and the role of that in sustainability. And of course, if we're looking at, at resource productivity, um, it isn't an exact correlation, but it's going to be quite close to carbon productivity. If you're using less resources, you're having less of a, of a carbon impact. And of course, um, carbon footprinting, particularly for, for complex um, uh, for complex engineering projects and things, uh, or even for building a house, actually, is a hugely challenging and expensive thing to do. So maybe there's a step before we can get to being able to do all this carbon footprinting that we might be using resource productivity as a kind of as a kind of uh, uh, surrogate. And then actually saying that that links us into the digital economy um, brings me perhaps to the last point. Uh, I wanted to make, which was to pick up on what uh, Fiona Reynolds said um, about uh, sustainability and GDP growth. Um, because I think it's hugely important we do move away from GDP from a climate and sustainability point of view. Um, we've had the Das Gupta review reminding us um, really strongly, I think, that we are using up the natural environment much faster than it can regenerate itself. We've had many studies showing us how that we are using up the, uh, the Earth's mineral supplies. And of course, many of the things we need to do to get to net zero, such as electrification, put huge pressure on our mineral resources, our natural resources. We're using them in really unsustainable way. Um, but a kind of productivity focus, which is about using all of these things more and more efficiently um, rather than GDP, which is about using more and more of them, I think could actually be beneficial here. So I, for me, it, it sparked a really interesting train of thought, Diane. So thank you very much for giving me the prod. Well, you've articulated brilliantly why we invited you, Julia. And I was just raising, <laughs> <laughs> raising my eyebrows at Matthew because he knows what he and I'll be talking about on Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to turn to Meredith now, and um, Meredith, your expertise is international trade and um, looking at, at markets and how the trade between businesses and countries and market structures affect productivity. Yeah, so the, I'm, from the international economics perspective, um, as Bart laid out, you know, the definition for economists of productivity is what do you get in terms of output above and beyond what you put in. So output over input, how much has that increased? And so what we know from a series of studies all around the world from trade liberalizations that took place largely in the 1980s is that opening up to trade raises the aggregate level of productivity in an economy tremendously. So one of the early studies looked at the Chilean trade liberalization found over several years, an increase in aggregate productivity of 19%. Um, we can go to the high income world and look at the Canadian trade liberalization with the US Canada free trade agreement from 1989, raising Canadian labor productivity, eight and a half percent. So exposing an economy to more competition creates this increase in what you get in terms of output relative to the inputs that you put in. So the question is, well, what's the mechanism for that? 
And so these various studies, and I just highlighted two, but this has been done again and again around the world as different economies have opened. Um, one is that if you are a domestic firm operating in Canada and you're exposed to more competition from the United States, your incentive to engage and adopt new innovative technologies has just gone up. And so one, there's what we call a within the firm increase in productivity and efficiency associated with newer, better technologies. And then, and this is the more difficult part, it's important for a society, but can be very sort of negative for individuals, is we have a reallocation effect. And this is where within any economy, there's a distribution of how efficient some firms are relative to others. And so one firm that makes tennis shoes is just going to be a little bit better at it than another firm. And so what we found with these trade liberalizations is when you open the Chilean economy to exposure with international competition, the weakest, least efficient firms tend to just shut down entirely. Either they reduce their output significantly and they contribute less to the country's overall output. And then at the same time, the most efficient firms are expanding and they're hiring that freed up labor. And so that's what we call the reallocative productivity effect of a trade liberalization. So our first story from international trade is that there is an amazing improvement in human well-being associated with more material output being available given the inputs you used. And this is the sort of story from the 80s and 90s. Now, as I talked about inputs and outputs, and Bart has as well, you might have in your mind a vision of a ball bearing or a spark plug going in, and at the end, we have a car. But when, as economists, we measure productivity, we're looking at a cash expenditure on inputs, be they capital, labor, material goods like ball bearings, um, energy, and a revenue-based measure of output. So not just how many cars you produce, but the price you get for each car. And so this has led to the sort of newer range of studies that have looked at the relationship between market concentration, market power, productivity, and innovation. And so what really matters here is when we have an economy undergoing huge transformation with exposure to competition, the prices of the things you put into your production process change. And the prices of the stuff coming out of your production process also change. And so if you think about, for example, India, circa 1991, huge trade liberalization and a lowering of tariffs meant that the prices of inputs were falling quite a lot, while at the same time, the overall prices of lots and lots of outputs being produced in the economy were falling. And so the question is, well, how do we figure out, is there real productivity coming here? Um, are firms having more market power? Are we getting market concentration? And what we see in sort of a very important study um, a few years ago, in the context of India, we could actually look at the physical outputs of these individual firms. So we knew how many bolts of cloth or how many you know, pounds of a particular chemical were being produced. And so it's possible for economists to construct what we call a quantity-based or physical measure of productivity that really looked at, given the inputs going in, how much did the physical units come out? And then with that evidence as a sort of starting point, they could then say, well, how much did these firms change the prices they charged for the stuff they made? And how much were the prices they were paying for the stuff they purchased on the input side changing? And the key finding from this study by um, former chief economist of the World Bank, Penny Goldberg, and some authors, was that actually these Indian firms, although they were increasing in productivity, they were also raising their markups, so their profit per unit, by about 13%. And so what this is, is essentially squeezing consumers through higher profits and you know, extracting the surplus out of consumers. So on the one hand, that's a sort of negative consequence of some of these trade liberalizations. We get a more efficient use of inputs to produce outputs, but we can also get a concentration of market power that allows firms more monopoly power and gives them a little bit of price gouging. Now, that's not entirely a bad thing because it is those profits that firms can use in some ways to engage in R&D and to engage in innovation. So I think this newer range of studies has really said, well, we've got to be quite careful and we look at how we're looking at productivity, but also how productivity relates to market concentration and, and market power. And here there's a tension. You want firms to have enough market power that they have some incentive and some profits around that they can engage in this newer 
innovation, but on the other, and things like climate mitigation, you need some profits and a little bit of a cushion to do these things and better use your resources. At the same time, if we give them too much market power, they're going to start squeezing consumers and maybe the benefits of, you know, are accruing to the firm in the form of higher profits. And to the extent that those profits in some firms are not widely dispersed across society, you can get some shifts in inequality. And then just one other thing I'll say about productivity. It's also when we have this problem of how do we measure the prices of inputs and how do we measure the prices of outputs, you know, another important complicating factor is how do we measure the value of ideas? And if you're a company like McDonald's, where do we ascribe the value of your ideas to if you're a global operator? And so another recent important study by a group of American economists has looked at how do the profits of US multinationals allocate around the world? And so essentially this study just published in January found that between 1982 and 2016, 38% of the income accruing to US multinational affiliates outside the borders of the US was actually value created in the United States. And so essentially what this means is some of the profits are being allocated to the Cayman Islands and Bermuda, when actually the idea that generated the profits was created maybe in New York City or you know, somewhere in um, Chicago. And so what this means in terms of you know, the study these authors did was actually measured US productivity and the most recent sort of slowdown in US productivity between 2004 and 2010 was it actually not as bad as we thought it was because through clever tax accounting and ascribing most of the product profits associated with ideas and new innovative processes within firms to happening outside the United States and tax haven countries, this essentially means that we've downgraded our income or you know, our revenue side in the United States and we've got it artificially low measure of productivity. And so again, this is important because if we think about public policy, and you know, this is a little bit different, but Bart mentioned already, you know, well, the ONS had a re, um, revision of their statistics and that changed our view of UK productivity. It's important to understand that this measurement is quite complicated. And as we get more and more information, we can refine our measurements. And if we're mis misrepresenting the actual value of productivity, we might get the public policy response wrong. And so if we, if we say that productivity was worse than we thought, then we might create too many tax incentives for firms to overinvest in innovation. But if we um, undervalue it, we might go in the other way, or if we overvalue it, we might go in the other way. So it's very important to get the measurement side of this problem right as a starting point. People who know me will know that I think economic statistics are the most interesting thing, but it doesn't make you popular at parties, I need to say. <laughs> <laughs> Could I ask you a quick follow-up, please, yeah. Meredith? We've been through the post-war period of great growth in trade and uh, globalization in the 1980s. It seems to slow down and we've got these concerns about supply chains now. Does that change uh, what we might expect in terms of the link between trade and, and productivity? So I think, I guess it, the two different questions that have come up recently, but are related. One was, you know, why aren't firms investing more in having more resilient supply chains, right? And so over the past few years, we've had all these delays in supply chains. And there was a question of, are firms under investing in having more resilient supply chains? And I think talking to different people who are economists, most of them would say, well, they looked at the risk. And they said, actually, you know, the risk to my profits, it's not really worthwhile for me to set up a separate plant for some input, one in China and one in Thailand. That's too costly, and it's not really worth the amount of risk that the firms felt they faced. Um, I think, actually, to me, one of the interesting things with, you know, the war in Ukraine is it, and it's similar to what we see with climate change, is I think this is a little bit more of potentially a game changer around supply chains, and this is like the energy supply chain. Because if you looked at, okay, well, if we use too much fossil fuel, that's going to lead to flooding in Bangladesh in 30 years. And 30 years from now, there's going to be problems associated with you know, adverse outcomes for children. Now, if it's, well, if today we're making you know, a product in Germany, and this is leading to a bomb falling you know, on a child immediately that we can see on TV, this 
might change some of the ideas around wanting to have resilient supply chains. Like we need to have sources of energy that are quite more secure and less associated with, you know, maybe helping regimes we don't like, or, you know, I guess it's, it's a similar thing. We've always had this incent incentive to have more clean sources and less fossil fuel source based energy. But I think if anything, the, the recent war is sort of driving home the need. It's not just climate change, but there's also more immediate, maybe national security pressing needs to clean up our, our, our energy sources. And so some parts of the supply chain, I think firms might be feeling right now, I need to make this more resilient. Julia, do you think um, the need for energy resilience, the understanding of, of the need for climate resilience is changing firms' behaviour? Uh, well, we've certainly seen it um, changing government's behaviour. I mean, I, I would say, the, and I would say so COVID has, has also changed government behaviour in terms of the need for supply chain resilience. I mean, from the Adaptation Committee of the Climate Change Committee, we've, we, um, we advise the government every five years on the UK's climate change risk assessment um, and for for the and we've just done that last year, but the five years before that, um, we we were saying that uh, supply chain resilience was a crucial issue for the UK from a climate perspective, and we've had all sorts of incidences like um, four or five years ago, flooding in Thailand um, pretty much stopped the entire world supply of disk drives. We've got some really strong examples. We could not get the UK government to accept that supply chain resilience should be on the list of, of the UK's key risks. Uh, in our advice this year, um, lo and behold, supply chain resilience was accepted without a single, <laughs> and, and actually we, this was just before the war in Ukraine. So I think it was the COVID impact and the empty supermarket shelves, but actually the war in Ukraine would have had, you know, exactly the same, uh, with, you know, is just reinforcing that impact. So suddenly that's a very hot topic and we haven't had any trouble getting, uh, getting them to accept. So it really has sharpened in the way yeah. you say. And I think, uh, you know, we hear, well, we see in the, in the government's um, new um, energy security strategy that's come out very recently, we see it going beyond the 40 gigawatts of offshore wind that were in the net zero strategy. Um, we see now they're aiming for up to 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 heroic target to be honest in terms of um, and also uh, a really significant increase in in nuclear ambition and that's been as you say driven by you know it's an acceleration of our, our net zero it will, will accelerate us towards our net zero target for energy but it's been driven by the, the energy security concerns so exactly yeah. as you suggest so, so Meredith, if you, you bring up a lot of interesting things here in explaining how trade theory in relation to productivity has has developed. So I was I was wondering I, when I talked about stretching the productivity concept, I mentioned this concept of intangibles, and yeah. so people like Jonathan Haskell and Ian Westlake also in their latest book talk a lot about the fact that the fact that our economy has become much more intangible. These price effects that you were identifying are actually becoming even more important and you know, perhaps someone troublesome if we don't lose them in the right way. What's your thinking around that? No, oh, I, I think you're exactly right. So the problem I explained with trade, trade is actually in some ways a very simple problem because people sell things that we can measure like cars. Now, the quality of a car can change if you have a big fancy car or you know, purely electric car or a car with certain attributes, a radio, no radio, but Fundamentally, it's, it's very measurable compared to the value of services. So if I hire a lawyer and I want to write a will, it's quite a simple thing. I have a simple life, you know, just writes out a paper. But if I'm, you know, trying to take over a company and I have lots of people employed for me and, you know, I need to challenge a patent, the legal services I buy are much more complex and much more differentiated. And we can't necessarily very easily measure what's the value of this legal service. And then, you know, even in courts, you can imagine there are times when there are legal rulings that kind of impact a whole society. And so the work may be done by one group of lawyers at one point in time is actually quite transformative. Whereas, you know, a lot of other stuff being done by lawyers is quite routine and, and small. And so measuring all kinds of things, financial services, financial products are a bit of a a nightmare, you know, so what's the value, you know, how would you price the value of having a checking account and all kinds of financial assets? But it potentially creates even more of these concentration effects in the economy, which could be detrimental to the productivity performance of the economy. Yes, and um, 
the existence of all of these platforms now and the power of platforms and how they shape pricing as well. Yeah, but this, this market concentration problem and increase. So the, the fundamental model we have when we think about estimating productivity and doing this inputs and outputs is we think about an economy where firms are what we call constant returns to scale. They're sort of very simple atomistic firms. And once we introduce large amounts of monopoly power, it complicates things because prices start moving around a lot more. And so the, it's just a, it's a much more complex and difficult problem. This takes me to um, a question I want to put to each of you before we turn to the audience. And it's about why, why this matters now and what's causing it. And it reminds me a little bit of one of those Agatha Christie novels where everybody is the, is the potential culprit. And there are many um, uh, possible answers. And so my question is, is the worrying about productivity code for saying the economic system just isn't working very well anymore? Some people might call it a crisis of capitalism and um, uh, people are not benefiting in the way they did in the past from the innovations. We see all these huge new risks. We see the uh, big companies that don't seem to be um, sharing the benefits that they're creating broadly in society. Um, so is it actually we talk about productivity, but is it something much more systemic than that? And you go ahead first, Bart. Yeah, I'm not quite sure I would entirely agree with it, but an element probably, yes. So, so first of all, productivity is very volatile. It has a big cyclical effect to it. So, you know, if we still believe there's something like a business cycle, which I think I do, is uh, you don't receive it all the time, but I think it's still there. Productivity sort of goes along with that business cycle. Um, so, so it goes up and down and it happens all the time. Uh, on the other hand, it is true that we see this sort of longer term slowdown in productivity. And again, I mean, I started with that. I mean, we're very, and you, you also emphasize this, Meredith, we were very worried, or I said, Julia, we very much worry about the UK, about the productivity slowdown. But to be honest, most of the productivity slowdown happens in all the Western economies. And it has been a structural trend that has been happening since probably around 2005. So we're already facing one and a half decades in all of Europe and also in the United States of a significant productivity slowdown. So there is something going on. Now, is that a crisis or is it just that the economy as, as a process in changing capitalism is sort of evolving in a different way? This is why I'm raising this issue of these intangible elements of our capital equation. I mean, you know, machinery and equipment and transport instructions, important as they are, are becoming a much smaller part of our total amount of investment that we do in skills and people and resource and development and innovation and organizational changes and everything else that we've been talking about. And, and again, I refer here also to, to uh, um, Jonathan Haskell's and Stephen Westlake's book, who basically is saying, we, we're just not ready to deal with these. Our institutions are not yet ready to deal with that sort of change in the economy. So is that a crisis or is that just a natural evolution of capitalism? Well, you know, we can argue about that. Uh, now, having said all that, surely there are issues, Julia, I will certainly talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the climate crisis that we're facing that does create a crisis element, geopolitical uncertainty creates a crisis element, COVID has created a crisis element, but also a massive opportunity, which we're seeing with the sort of biggest labor market experiment in living memory by having suddenly a lot of people working from home and continuing wanting to do that for the longer term. So, you know, the crisis also gives us opportunities that actually can help us productivity to grow. So I think it's a very, very mixed story to what extent this is just a reflection of crisis or whether it's just a reflection of how economies evolve. Julia, crisis opportunity or both? Um, I hope the crisis is an opportunity because I think it, it's, this is not an economic system for a world which is nature constrained, which is resource constrained and which is going to have nine billion people in it. Um, it, it's a it's not systemic enough it doesn't take into account all the issues in the system it only looks at some of them and also the signals in the system are too slow um, if the signals were fast enough the carbon tax would be brilliant um, but it takes a long time to have an effect and and I, one of the for me one of the, the signals that I would just say in, in, in you know in the UK um, we have now have this ambition that our, we will have a zero emissions energy system by 2032. That suddenly means you can use as much energy as you like because it doesn't stop you getting to net zero. And because at the moment, uh, things like offshore wind are very cheap, um, it means we will build far more, and we, we are planning to build far more energy infrastructure than we actually need. That's really bad from a resource point of view. Um, 
It's bad for other people, not so much bad for people in the UK. Um, and it's because the system isn't giving the right signals yet. It will, because the materials we'll need for offshore wind turbines will start going up in price, but they haven't done so yet. And this is gonna be quite a time lag before we start thinking, no, we need to build less infrastructure and we need to have a much more sensible electricity system that does much more demand management, links our electric cars into our, uh, into our solar panels, into our heat pumps in a much more efficient way. But as, as is, we're moving towards an electricity. So we already have an electricity system where wind is curtailed 17%. If we go in the direction we're going in, we will see curtailment uh, at the moment, the long term, we'll see curtailment of 60, 70%. That's not a, an efficient electricity system. It means we've built much more infrastructure than we need. But there's a, a well-known economist called Robert Gordon who thinks that, argues in a, a book that came out a few years ago, that we are just fundamentally not innovating in the way that we did in the early 20th century when uh, transformations like electricity and indoor plumbing, indoor sanitation changed people's lives. But I think if we have an energy transition, actually that is the kind of uh, complete productivity game changer that we had in the early 20th century. But Meredith, can I push you towards saying there's a crisis? So I, I think, so productivity has slowed down. Separately, there's been a, a separation between increases in labor productivity and increases in median wages in societies in the high income world. And so I think the, so what that essentially means is you're the average worker in 1950, every time the economy became more productive, your wage was going up until about 1982. And sometime around 1982, this seemed to stop. And wages haven't grown with productivity. And I think that's this income inequality that we don't quite understand. It's not inherent as part of a capitalist system, but somehow some of these major economies we've seen in the US, UK, this separation between growth and average wages and growth and productivity. And I think that's part of the big problem um, in terms of people's feelings about their, their level of well-being. Now, the idea should be that as productivity grows, there's more output to distribute to everyone. And so everyone in society should be getting better off. It is the case that if we can do something to raise productivity, we think in theory that people should be better off. But I think going back over the last 30, 40 years, the first problem is that people in much of the high income world aren't feeling very good because many of them aren't really seeing the material wealth of their lives increasing at the same rate it was happening for their parents' generation. So I think we don't quite understand why that's been the case. And I think that this again goes back to this study of under trying to understand monopoly power and where are profits being shifted around the world? If you make profits, who gets them? <laughs> Where are they going? Um, is this being distributed broadly? So um, I don't know if we're- and, in a... and that might again be the result of the fact that, for example, technologies have just moving ahead of the policies to adjust to these kind of technologies and you know, the rising share of intangibles and all those kind of things may, may be playing a role. And all these things take time. You know, I mean, you, re, you refer to Robert Gordon, he's actually changed his mind a little because he probably was a little bit too early to say that you know, there were no productivity effects from the digital economy because they're actually visible. We're just not distributing them very well. And they're not, we don't see them in all the firms and they're very concentrated in some firms. And there's a diffusion issue that we need to deal with. So. I just say a related point is that you know, since about 2010, 2011, the growth of, of trade globally has slowed down. So it, mm -hmm. it was shooting up for, you know, the previous 20 years till until about 2010. And it's, it's just really kind of slowed down, stagnated. So I think we're in kind of more of a long run growth of trade is gonna be very slow. And so I think maybe in some ways, I'm not sure that firms are gonna be investing as much in local resilience of supply chains, but I think they might be trying to, in some cases, they're not reaching out to China and markets in East Asia as much anymore. And so that aspect of, of production isn't growing. And so to the extent that more growth is gonna be happening in, in the local regions, we might see more need for firms to be innovative to try to change what they're making. Um, I'm gonna to turn to the audience now which has been very patient. The way I like to do this is to make the people with the microphones run around as much as possible. So I will <laughs> be ranging across the whole room, um, but we'll start in the middle with the chair of the Regional Productivity Forum for the East of England, Alex. And um, 
uh, then at the front here and then at the back. Um, thanks, Diane. Thanks, panel. So as you as you said, I chair the Regional Productivity Forum for East Anglia. I'm Alex Plant. I also work for Anglian Water in my day job. Um, and I'm also the chair of the policy group for Cambridge Ahead, which is the organisation bringing large employers together in, in this, uh, this particular region. My background actually is in government, both central, regional and local. So thought about these issues across all of those. I, I suppose my question really comes back to thinking about productivity and the way the panel's talked about it, and particularly the UK's kind of lag in productivity performance, which is a, a classic hardy perennial in policy terms. And the work that Bart, you're leading, and Diane, you're involved in through the Productivity Institute, tries to look at that productivity question, not just at the national level, where a lot of the points that uh, Meredith is making are really relevant around competition policy and those things that must be national, but also at the local and regional level, recognising the barriers to productivity growth will be different in somewhere like Greater Cambridge than they would be in Blythe. And so my question is, is part of the UK's problem on productivity linked to some of the conclusions of this morning's first session around a sense of over centralization in the UK, insufficient devolution and particularly fiscal devolution to local and regional layers. And if so, can we use the kind of COVID crisis, the climate crisis, the thinking in the leveling up white paper to actually break free from the kind of shackles that Chris Wormel was talking about earlier, where we have governments talking a good game on Devo and never actually delivering on it. Is this the moment where we can try and break free from that? Thank you, Alex. Question at the front here. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the question? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is, which, which model you would like to suggest in the context of productivity in the prevailing circumstance? Thank you. Sorry, could you repeat yeah, that? I didn't, you, I didn't yeah. hear it. Which model? <laughs> we'll come back to you for your question later. <laughs> yes, my question is, which model you would like to suggest in the context of productivity in the contemporary scenario? Thank you. Okay. And then there was one right at the back in the middle of this row in a blue shirt. Oh. There are too many blue shirts. It was a gentleman behind you, actually. Can, Purple. can we I'll come? I'll ask a question later then. Thank you. <laughs> I've already got the next round of questions lined up, obviously. Sorry, mate. Um, <laughs> uh, the general presumption, of course, is that productivity is a good thing to increase, but we do also hear an awful lot about worker exploitation, child labor, slave wages, and not only in the underdeveloped world, but also in Dover. And there are always stories about workers being exploited in the fields around East Anglia, just where we are. Um, how can you go too far? Or what do you do about going too far in the search for productivity? Thank you. So let's take those and um, then come back for another round. Bart, do you want to start? Pick what yeah. you like. So, well, let me start with Alex's question uh, about what about sort of the regional uh, uh, local element of this. And we, because it's such a nice ad, you know, a nice connection to what we've been talking about earlier uh, today. Um, there's absolute, again, regional spatial inequality and productivity exists everywhere in the Western world. The UK in that sense is not an exception. You go, you travel in France and you see massive differences, even in a small place like the Netherlands where I'm from, there are large differences. There's some peculiarities throughout the UK issue, which we can talk about endlessly. One of them is that our second tier cities tend to be very far behind their comparator cities in Western Europe. I've done some work on that myself, you know, places like Birmingham and Glasgow and Manchester are about 75% in terms of productivity of what their comparative countries in Europe are. So we have, a, we have a real issue there. And we have an issue of left behind places to use that terminology. And one of the issues with left behind places, which again are everywhere, is that, and this came up this morning about in the first session when we were talking about people leaving those places, which is bad. But what's even worse is that people get stuck in places and that are ending up in a low level equilibrium. And my sense is, although I can't prove this completely scientifically, my sense is we have more low level equilibrium places that are stuck where there is just no movement anymore than what I'm seeing in other countries. So we need, we need to begin to, to, to tackle that. And there was a really good discussion about it, of course, in the first session this morning, which I don't want to do again. Uh, here, but I do think there are a couple of elements that come back very importantly for productivity. 
One is consistency. I'm going to use a couple of C's here. One is consistency of policy, which is long-term focus. You can't do this, just you know, do one thing and do the next thing again, and then change the old policy or just abolish it or whatever. So the C of consistency is very important. Coordination is important. We need to get you know, places at a local and a regional level, people around the table who coordinate and then use the third and who collaborate uh, in this respect. And, you know, for me, uh, uh, coming back to the UK for the second time, uh, working on these kind of issues, uh, I, I just see that, you know, we have so many fantastic ideas and initiatives in this country, but we let so much go get lost because we're failing to coordinate and collaborate at the local level. Which brings me to the issue of the C, which is perhaps the most debatable, and that's compromise. And here I sort of you know, betray my Dutch traits a little bit, because if you collaborate and coordinate, you also got to compromise. You know, you can't do everything. You have to sort of find the middle round, ground, and that is quite often hard to do. Also creates bureaucracy now and then, long time before people create another C, which is consensus. And finally, there is communicate, because it's also the fact that we don't really explain very well to in, in the local areas how productivity can be changed and why this is beneficial. You know, I mean, again, businesses, we talked about that. I think about productivity in terms of cost efficiency quite often, particularly small and medium enterprises. The average person in the street, if you ask them what productivity is, they'll probably tell you, well, I don't know. But if you, if you would really press me, it's probably the end of my job. And they're perhaps not entirely wrong about that if we don't think about how productivity can be a positive driver if you think about this sort of broader concept. So I think there's really a lot of work to be done in terms of local and regional coordination where I think productivity can really play a critical, uh, a critical role. And the last bit of your comments there speaks to the third question as well. I think about, so as well, yeah, so I'll stop. Bring you down work costs. Yeah. Um, Meredith, if you want to pick up any of those, what mo model do we want to see, worker exploitation? So, um, in terms of what model we should use to measure productivity, it's a little bit specific on the precise question we want to answer. And so just when I was talking earlier about, you know, the study of Canada, what was available to researchers were um, information on workers and then information on output. So other types of inputs in the production process weren't really available. And so they had to do their, their study in terms of measuring labor productivity. And so while other things might be important to know about in the Canadian context, it just wasn't, the data wasn't available. Now, in terms of you know, what we would ideally like to know when we measure productivity is we'd like to know all of the inputs and we'd like to know all of the outputs and we'd like to know them in quantity terms. But it becomes difficult if we have a physical quantity measure of productivity for a firm. It's hard to compare these growths across different firms. And that's why we use revenue and expenditure based models. Um, in terms of, um, I just say about the, the devolution and the, you know, so I'm from America, which is a federal system. And there, the problem we're constantly faced with is um, tax competition across jurisdictions. Mm -hmm leading to the brand new Toyota plant being built in Alabama and losing you know, some sort of production plant in Detroit or Michigan. And why does this matter in terms of like aggregate productivity at the national level? It's shifting resources in terms of taxable resources and the tax base from one place to another. And that's gonna have, because the way education is financed, for example, that's gonna have big impacts on the educational opportunities of children in different parts of the country. So while having the local area have a lot of input into, you know, how you should design policy to encourage, you know, production and should you have coordination at a national level versus regional, that's important. But there's also the downside of too much competition across areas within a country can be a problem. And it's the same thing where I was talking about this issue with profit shifting globally. You know, one of the big proposals from the Biden administration was to have a sort of universal minimum corporate tax rate among all the high income countries. And this was precisely to get around some of the problem of this shifting of tax base. It's a big problem in Europe because Ireland's essentially a tax haven where all the big US multinationals book their profits. And that takes away from resources and tax money in countries like France and the UK. Um, and then just in terms of um, worker exploitation, I mean, at some level, it's a moral issue and a law enforcement issue. Um, and, you know, different countries have different problems regarding, you know, the existence of slave labor, the existence of child labor. Um, in international trade law, you know, you 
there's prohibitions on the use of slave labor in any products that are traded internationally. It's difficult for the individual countries to always enforce that. And so a lot of times there's the sort of turning to nonprofits to try to um, enforce that. But I mean, the, the general, it, from a productivity perspective, if you have kids not going to school, but instead working when they're young and they should be learning how to you know, do math and read, that's gonna have an impact on the society's human capital, which is gonna feed into their productivity you know, 20 years down the road and have a, a negative consequence for productivity. So even from a purely self-interested perspective, um, it, it's not a great thing to exploit children. Um, if you just care about economic <laughs> output, actually you do better by um, educating them <laughs> and making them more um, productive humans in the future. Economists against exploiting children, we've yeah. made progress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Julia. But there are things you can exploit and you can exploit every kilowatt hour of electricity absolutely as far as possible and every, every kilogram of molybdenum. Uh, and so, you know, that resource productivity is something you really can drive without those negative <laughs> without those negative side effects and and just on the on the kind of local um the devolution thing um of course particularly on the adaptation to climate change um, um uh, side um the climate and the weather and the situation and therefore how those interact is fundamentally local um and you know we we really in order to avoid the productivity problems of, of climate impacts, we really do need uh, more local power, more, more devolution of, of power for, you know, for the placemaking, for, the, um, for the, the local building standards that need to be applied, um, more local funding, because actually locally they know where that funding is needed, they know where that nursing home that might be affected by flooding is, all those things are local knowledge and let me advertise a brilliant project that's going on in Cambridge which is the Credo project um, which is looking at uh, interacting risks from climate so it's looking at understanding which electricity substation um, is being used by which um, communications providers is support is is driving um, the, the performance of which water company and which network of homes who are who are reliant on that and you know actually that's something that local government needs to be right on top of in terms of understanding risks to the area all of those which are risks to people but also risks to the productivity of an area so absolutely we need to be making these messages about the need for more devolution of of, of powers and and indeed funding fantastic <clears throat> i can't entirely see the clock i have to confess and we're having a wonderful time but i think we've got time for another round of questions if there are some um, where shall I make the microphones run to? So there's one over there, Vianney, please, lady in the greyish jacket. And the gentleman in the blue shirt we missed last time will go next. And then I'm going to take one from online. Hi, um, so I'm Simone, I'm a PhD student here at the university. And uh, I'm kind of following up on the previous question about exploitation. So I was interested in this equation that you brought up, Bart, because I'm a physicist, so I like equations about the output over input and like about the human cost of that input. So we've heard a lot about the molybdenum or the hours worked or the cost of production, but not so much on kind of the human aspect. And we can stay within legal frameworks without having to go to slavery, like the kind of worker satisfaction or um, exploitation of workers within what is legal or kind of precarity of contracts and so on. And so how we might begin to include the human cost of what it takes for a company to be productive or make a large profit and whether we need to, like, do you, I would, I'm interested in um, hearing your opinions on how we should be including that within the productivity model and how we might be measuring those things and what things would be important to include. Thanks. So the online question is not unrelated. It's from Jane Patterson Todd of Cambridge Ahead. Um, and it's about working from home. And if that continues or we get a switch to hybrid working, what's the effect of that going to be on productivity? And the gentleman in the middle here. Hello, uh, my name is Keith Herman. Um, I work as a consultant in higher education and I'm really interested in helping young people bring the future forward. But when I look at today's reality and the near future, there are some real challenges for young people around, for example, the climate emergency. There's a lot of anxiety and engagement and enthusiasm for that because it's their future. And yet we see some fairly 
poor decision making in government in the UK and around the world around how we really respond to this crisis. Uh, there's also the cost of living crisis that many young people are facing today. Inflation is just one indicator of that. But also, if you look at their futures and their experiences in place, for example, around learning and access to learning, uh, more and more young people are, are forced to stay at home when it comes to studying rather than going, like is the traditional model in the UK, go somewhere else to study and learn. Uh, these experiences are creating a lot of anxiety, uh, issues around well-being for young people. So with that, those issues and challenges facing young people, pro productivity, you could argue, doesn't matter to them, does it? Thank you very much. So a cluster of questions around people and productivity. Um, let's, let's turn to Meredith first this time. Okay. Um, so I would argue that productivity matters a whole lot to young people because the increase of what we produce materially over what we put in materially is sort of this measure of our ignorance, this sort of productivity is this little gain and it compounds over time. And so actually it, it matters more for young people than it does for people um, at the end of their lives. But I can, I mean, I can appreciate that, you know, young people are facing a number of you know, constraints that they look at older generations they didn't face. You know, people used to have free education, now you have to pay for it. People used to be able to, you know, work for a month and then put a down payment on an apartment and they can't anymore. And so there's, so that, but these are sort of complicated problems that are not entirely um, addressed by productivity. I mean, I think these are a little bit more sort of generational justice issues and you know, around issues of who's voting, what are the biggest demographic groups voting and, and driving public policy. So um, I think they should be thinking about productivity and how they can enhance, you know, an individual level, the more you, you get sort of educated or skilled, so not necessarily university education, but some skills that can contribute to raising your wage, the better your individual well being would be. But um, you know, in some sense, I think the answer is like political action, right? And it's difficult, um, but that's a little bit further afield from productivity. And then just in terms of the um, question of, you know, sort of the human aspect of productivity measurement, you know, most, most places have laws against um, different forms of exploitation of workers. I'll just say briefly, um, when as economists, we measure productivity and we measure labor hours, um, there's a lot of work done looking at the relationship between what we call formal labor hours in a firm and informal hours. And this is where essentially we know some, in, especially in, in lower income countries, some of the workers are paid formally on the books, they have contracts, and so they're one particular type of worker, but then the same firm also has a lot of essentially illegal workers who don't pay taxes and are more day laborers and, and less attached to the firm. Their outcomes usually aren't as good. The first step is trying to figure out how large this population is, how you get this informal population to be more formalized, because once you have a sense of how many there are in this more fringe occupations with more marginal attachment to firms, then you have a set for establishing a base on which you can build a public policy um, to enhance the well-being of these less well-attached workers who don't have necessarily the same treatment by their firms um, as others. I'll just stop there. Thank you. So Julia, my perception is there's a real generational change in attitudes to net zero. Do you think that's correct? Uh, I've certainly recently met some um, really brilliant young people who've sort of taking things into their own hands. And the most recent one was I was at a Royal Society conference last week on the latest IPCC report. And uh, over coffee, I met this young woman who set up something which I think is called Swap Up. Um, but it's a, it's a scheme for um, school children um, to uh, essentially trade clothes. Uh, all of this really fast fashion that's really cheap, that that young people buy and kind of wear once and then uh, and then discard. She set up this scheme whereby, and of course, if they're you know if they're school kids, they're actually growing and they grow out of some of these things too, where they can, uh, which is token based, where they can bring in their 
things and get tokens for them, where schools can also reward them with tokens for good pieces of work or for good behavior or whatever. Um, and you can, uh, these, these garments that somebody may have worn very little can have another life. So somebody who's out there doing something for the circular economy, which actually addresses one of the really significant issues for young people, which is, which is fast fashion that, that, that barely gets worn. Um, and I just found her totally inspirational. And um, she um, is doing this on no money at all, but has already got a foothold in quite a number of schools. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is brilliant. These are the kind of examples young people need to see that, that actually don't be depressed. You can make a difference. And I thought that was, uh, that was absolutely fabulous. Although, as others pointed out earlier, that would reduce, in the first instance, um, measured GDP. Hmm. Sorry? In the first instance, that reduces measured yeah. GDP. Yeah. <laughs> and, and productivity but, but, metrics. But, but it improves resource efficiency. <laughs> uh, Bart, the working from home question. Yeah. Uh, exciting topic that lots of people uh, talk about uh, all the time. So, so first of all, we're still in the middle of this labor market experiment, right? So let's not make a final judgment. Actually, it was interesting to see that when the pandemic hit, we actually made quite significant productivity gains. You all remember that when you were sent home and suddenly had to work from home, it was actually amazing how much what I would call latent technology was there that suddenly was applied. And actually, after a while, it worked quite well. So we do know from the numbers, it's not so visible in the macro numbers, but certainly from at the business level, we see a lot of evidence that actually that in that first phase of the pandemic, there were productivity gains because we very quickly leveraged that existing digital technology. Then you got the second phase. You all remember that late 2020, early 2021, when we were all com completely fed up, not just with the pandemic, but also with Zoom calls and tired and burnouts and everything else. It was really bad. And I think we all had that experience because we figured that this model was not going to be sustainable in the longer term, that something you know, had to, had to, something was out of balance, if you like. Then, hopefully now that we get towards the, the end of the worst of this pandemic, where you begin to get some more evidence, and we have quite a bit of evidence where people's preferences are. By the way, let's not forget that 30, between 30 and 50% of the people have no choice where they want to work, but there's another 50% of the workforce, which is quite large, which has a choice. And we know that the big majority of that 30, 50, 50 plus percent of the population has a preference for a hybrid working model. model. Uh, free, two free days at home, two free days in the office. There are people, quite often young people, by the way, to the early question, who want to spend all their time out of their door. That's kind of for, for understandable reasons. There are also some people, quite often somewhat older people, who say, I'm actually fine with this model work, uh, working from home all the time. But the majority wants to have this kind of middle model. Now, why don't we know what the productivity results are? Because we're still experimenting with this. So there's a group of companies, luckily they're not very large, although you shouldn't exaggerate it, who basically say, this stuff is too difficult, everybody back into the office. You know, forget it, I'm not gonna do this, back in the office. There, there are, actually, I think there are quite a few smaller companies that have gone down that road, not consider that actually the preference of their people is something else than the model they're applying. At the other end, there is a group of companies that basically say, well, we don't know how to do this, but we'll just, we'll just find out, right? So we'll just kind of let this happen. And you have a lot of pain then because it turns out that some people are there, some people are not there. Uh, there's not very well connected. It's not coordinated. And I think that the companies that are really beginning to get their arms around it are strategizing around this. They're trying to figure out who wants to work from home, who not, when are teams in the office, how can we optimally uh, uh, mix uh, the digital functions that we have and improve them versus the in-person function. So, so I think we're still in the middle of this experiment. I'm on the fence to see whether this will ultimately give us a productivity gain at the macro level. It could. I think more has to happen than just work from home to, to, to make, that, make that happen. But I think the most important thing is that you know, a very large portion of the population wants something else than what it was before the pandemic. And that, I think, needs a response because otherwise we'll definitely not have a productivity gain. Can I, can I just come in and say, for me, I agree with everything you've said, except that it just for me says we have much too narrow a definition of what we mean by productivity, mm. because um, water consumption shot up when everybody started to work from home in the pandemic. Um, that's a really crucial resource, particularly in this region where we're a highly water stressed region of the country. Um, that's an input we need to take into account. Yeah, um, and, and, you know, there will be other things like um, power consumption. And, uh, and gas consumption in some homes will also have gone up through 
certainly through the lockdown in the winter and things. Uh, so it's not just the fact that firms got more work out of their people. So for the firm, that might be better. But actually, for us nationally, we need to take into account the other things that changed before we decide that was a really big productivity benefit. Yeah. We are out of time, and I'm sorry for those who wanted to ask a question and haven't had time to do so. I was going to end with a straw poll to see if people thought the hybrid model would increase productivity or not. And then I realised I can't do that because we have so many people online. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't set, haven't set Cell up, selection. I haven't set up the poll for them, so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a good sample, and, um, and we can't do that. Um, what happens next is that we have a 15-minute break, um, so you don't have long enough to go and you know, wander off to the other end of the, of the grounds here, um, but do stretch your legs. We need to rearrange the stage for the keynote. Um, so please be back here promptly at 5.15. Uh, but meanwhile, please join me in thanking our brilliant panel. Thank you.